All right. Well, I show 201. So we'll go ahead and t talk with this, uh, begin with this afternoon's talk. This is the talk called Self-Determination, Imperialism, and Secession. Subtitle is Three Sides of the Same Coin. I know that abuses the analogy a little bit, but I think you'll, you'll see how it works. You might also say that self-determination, imperialism, and secession are three ways of looking at the same object. Because uh, as we will see, uh, the tradition of self-determination is, is closely connected to the issue of secession and also its opposite then, imperialism and colonialism. And uh, Mises is, is very good on this and will go into uh, some detail here using some of the scholarly sources as well. So this is an academic talk. So the people I mention here uh, with some of their commentary and uh, some of their, uh, their work that they've done on this issue are outside our usual circles. I can provide you with footnotes for these people if you want. Uh, for example, we'll mention uh, Alan Buchanan, who's written extensively on the ethics of secession and such, but just isn't on our usual circles. So let's talk about these topics. And I think we're going to start uh, with Ludwig von Mises to really get an idea of how should we be thinking about the issue of self-determination. And of course, being Mises, it's very much within the liberal tradition. And so when I use the word liberal, I always mean it in terms of historical liberalism, classical liberalism, uh, what Mises would have used uh, in terms of that term. So let's look to his 1927 book, Liberalism. Now here, he takes a strict and expansive view in favor of quote unquote, self-determination. Specifically, he noted that respect for the right of self-determination required states to allow the separation of new polities via secession. He writes, the right of self-determination in regard to the question of membership in a state thus means whenever the inhabitants of a particular territory, whether it be a single village, a whole district, or a series of adjacent districts, make it known by a freely conducted plebiscite that they no longer wish to remain united to the state in which they belong at the time, their wishes are to be respected and complied with. Put another way, secession is the means or tool by which self-determination is expressed and preserved in real world politics. The two concepts are intimately connected. Now, where does Mises get this idea of self-determination? Uh, in his case, he's drawing upon currents of thought alive and well in Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century, largely among liberals. Uh, now, this it certainly goes back farther. We can look at the concept of self-determination, although not the phrase, was already well known as the driving force behind the American revolutionaries when the colonies seceded from the British Empire in the 1770s. Uh, historian... David Armitage, hardly a hardcore libertarian, describes the United States' war for independence as essentially the practical and political starting point for modern ideas of self-determination. While the philosophical roots of self-determination are often attributed to Immanuel Kant, uh, the prototype for real-life secession movements uh, are found in the American war for independence. Now, referring to Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, Armitage writes, the notion that one people, that is Jefferson's term, might find it necessary to dissolve its links with a larger polity, that is, that it might legitimately attempt to secede, was almost entirely unprecedented and barely accepted at the time of the American Revolution. Now, certainly this happened, right? Polities split into pieces, but the idea that, you, that there was some sort of right among the individuals to do this, that there was a right of revolution, uh, was a new notion. Now, the success of the United States, the colonies, in asserting a right to self-determination provoked similar movements in Europe and Latin America in the decades following American independence. For instance, Armitage notes that language of self-determination, quote unquote, found in the Declaration of Independence, would show up repeatedly with Latin American, European, and Asian movements seeking political independence of their own. Now, in the Declaration, Jefferson was, of course, drawing heavily on the thought of John Locke, who himself recognized a right to self-determination secured through secession. Uh, he did not do it as explicitly as Jefferson does, 
but there's been some good work on this by a political scientist named Lee Ward. And he notes that Locke, quote, had a highly developed right of revolution analogous to a remedial right of secession, unquote. And this was based on, quote, property rights of a conquered people. So Locke could see that people, a group of people had been conquered by some other group of people, nevertheless, because it's Locke, Locke recognized that they had property rights even if the state didn't recognize them, that in order to remediate the situation, to assert their property rights, they had a right to revolution, which actualized itself as secession. His specific example at the time that he used uh, was the Greeks, who he saw had a right to self-determination and secession away from the Turks, who, of course, at that time ruled the Greeks. Now, Locke, uh, being a logical guy, he, he, and being someone not quite won over to ideas of Misesian hardcore self-determination, uh, he did fear where this was leading, right, if there was no limitation put on who could assert a right to self-determination. Now, Locke suggested that only groups with size, institutions, and cohesion substantial enough to form their own legislatures could exercise a right to secession. So he's putting a limit on there. You have to have your own legislation, legislature. You got to have some sort of group cohesion. Uh, however, even here, Locke is not overly rigid. There remains in his formulation the potential for a wide variety of groups to exercise some sort of group cohesion, create their own legislative bodies. And so on. He's not, he doesn't have any uh, objective limitations on it beyond simply, hey, you've got to have some sort of group. Um, now, Jefferson adopted a more flexible attitude than Locke on this. He assumed that new secession movements in America would occur after the revolution. Um, and he did not, he never really seemed to express much concern with the details of which groups would do this. He just take, took it as a given and thought, great. Um, at some point in the future, people will secede. This will be a great way to avoid civil war. Uh, people should have listened to Jefferson. For example, um, well, let's go on and move and look at uh, what happens in Europe around this idea of self-determination. Now, the, the spread in the late 18th century and into the 19th century of self-determination was something that we can identify. And it was a central theme, for example, in Poland's fight in 1794 to fully separate from the Prussian, Austrian, and Russian states. Uh, now, Poland had been fighting ongoing fight for many centuries, trying to assert some sort of self-determination. It was, had the Prussians on one side on the west, had the Russians on the east, it had the Austrians on the south. Uh, there was really a, not a worse place to be uh, as a, any sort of cohesive national group. And the, uh, the, the Poles ran into this problem consistently. Now, so they had a number of separatist movements. Their most notable of which in the 1790s was led by a man named Tadeusz Kosciuszko, who had been an officer in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. He was quite familiar with the Declaration of Independence and those issues in general. And uh, historian Victor Catan notes that Kosciuszko was pushing for self-determination well before the concept entered the common lexicon in Europe. Now, Mises, of course, was well-versed in Polish history, and I'm sure aware of this. Uh, he would have been even more aware of the battles that raged within the Habsburg lands over the issue of self-determination. Chief among these was Hungary's attempt to secede from the Austrian Empire in 1848. These conflicts were very much couched in terms of self-determination. Now, by the 1870s, the phrase self-determination appears to have been increasingly common, especially in the German version of the phrase. And we find that, for example, uh, being used among Czech parliamentarians of the Austrian Imperial Council in 1870. It's also found, the French version is also found at least as early as 1862. And of course, if you read liberalism, which we started this talk with quoting by Mises, that's an English translation of the original German translated by Ralph Rako. So, uh, that's the version everybody reads now. If you go back and you, you read the English, well, you can see Reiko, he translated the German phrase used by Mises there into the phrase self-determination uh, for good reason. So we can find a long history of the term and the concept uh, going back well uh, into at least the 18th century. Now, 
Self-determination uh, via secession also gained support among French radical liberals, Gustave de Molinari and Charles Dunoyer, some very radical French speakers. Uh, Molinari was Belgian. Uh, indeed, it is with Molinari that we see what is perhaps the first explicit endorsement of more or less top-to-bottom secession in support of self-determination. And Molinari called this the double right of, self, of secession. The idea here is that the commune can secede from the province and the province can secede from the central state. That is, self-determination is no way limited to any large recognized political entity, ethnicity, or religious group. Um, it's, uh, it's not merely some, something for an ethnicity. It's not for a government uh, level, or for a level of government, i.e. an American state government, for example. Uh, here we see similar view to that of Mises, which Mises was talking about 40 years later. The right to self-determination expressed and uh, secured through a plebiscite extends all the way down to even the smallest entity. Uh, Rothbard, a disciple of both Mises and Molinari, unsurprisingly, adopts a very flexible view himself uh, for self-determination. He wrote in 1969, secession is a crucial part of the libertarian philosophy that every state be allowed to secede from the nation, every sub-state from the state, every neighborhood from the city, and logically every individual or group from the neighborhood. Here I think we should uh, make a, a note that we should not confuse this view of self-determination with some other uh, pro-secessionist movements and views that did exist, but certainly did not take the expansive Misesian or Rothbardian view on self-determination. We see this in two examples, especially uh, in the United States and uh, in Austria-Hungary, or uh, the Austrian Empire at the time that the Hungarians were, were trying to secede. We, what we see in a lot of cases are groups that they want uh, secession and separatism for themselves, but don't grant it to anybody else. And this, was, this occurred with the Hungarians in the 1840s, where the Hungarians wanted their own parliament, they wanted their own self-rule within the Austrian Empire, but they denied it to all the other ethnicities that were within their purview. So, of course, in the empire at the time, you had the Hungarians, you had uh, also um, Croatians, you had Slovenians, you had some Serbians, you had a variety of different groups, and the Hungarians saw themselves as getting secession for themselves, but then forcing all those other groups to learn Hungarian and to uh, govern themselves in line with what the Hungarians wanted. And this was based on some nationalist arguments uh, that they put forward, but you can see the inconsistency. Um, and they were called on this to a certain extent. The other issue you encounter is in the United States where the argument in favor of secession uh, made by Calhoun, for example, uh, made no provision for secession for anybody except the state governments. And this was true because it wasn't based on a philosophical ideal of self-determination, but based on a legal reality. So uh, the arguments much, uh, much more there were about, okay, the United States has this contract as the compact theory of the Constitution, which I agree with. But that's a very, very limited view of when secession is allowed. What it basically was saying is that secession for these government entities is, is allowed because that's what the contract allows. And so you could see how, boy, that is just a tiny sliver of what Mises is talking about in terms of self-determination and what Molinari might talk about in terms of self-determination going up and down the ladder for all sorts of different groups. Uh, Rothbard called out Calhoun on this. He was just saying that, hey, look, um, the right to self-determination is fairly meaningless if it's only really limited to exactly one group of governments that are allowed to do it. And as we can see from his writings, he, um, he took a far more expansive view. Now, the issue then of self-determination has broken out far beyond just the libertarian and classical liberal groups. Of course, the term starts to get co-opted as so many things that the liberals and libertarians do, uh, starts to get co-opted by bad guys. Uh, Lenin used the term in his own writings uh, in an attempt to peel off uh, groups from what he saw as the Western imperial powers. Uh, he tried to animate these other nationalities and other groups saying, hey, you have self-determination, you should peel off and then join our socialist state. So he used that term rather effectively and then, of course, you had Woodrow Wilson, certainly not one of the good guys, using the term extensively in the wake of World War I, 
in an effort to uh, engage in a bunch of real politique, he, he used it as a way to uh, basically stick it to the Germans and uh, peel off a bunch of pieces of Germany after the war, claiming that those people had self-determination, which in many cases they did. Uh, but of course, real true respect for self-determination wasn't uh, among Wilson's motivations, especially since he wasn't willing to afford self-determination for any German groups that wanted independence from anybody else. Now, this term now has entered the general lexicon among just your usual international community and its scholars. The United Nations, for example, uh, employs uh, the term, even though we now have all these people who are anti-secessionists telling us how secession is some sort of right-wing reactionary thing that only traditionalist conservatives want, this would be news to uh, the people who wrote the United Nations Charter, uh, which explicitly lists a right to self-determination and therefore a right to political separation by secession among the basic rights it enumerates. And self-determination is a well-established right across the political spectrum. And at this point, the debate over self-determination is only a debate over when and where the right may be invoked. Uh, almost everyone who writes on the issue of self-determination accepts that this is a right of some kind. Now, when the charter was adopted in 1945, colonial powers such as Britain and France were reluctant to approve any broad interpretation of the concept of self-determination uh, for obvious reasons, right? As we see here, Winston Churchill, after years of denouncing Germans for violating self-determination rights in Europe, turned around and insisted that the concept did not apply to Africans. So, uh, you know, we have, we're British, we've got all these... Uh, German, oh, I've got all these colonies in Africa. Well, those people don't have self-determination uh, because, of course, Churchill was a dyed-in-the-wool imperialist. Now, uh, of course, the British was not alone in this hypocrisy, right? The Americans, uh, to this day, they, they love to talk about being anti-colonialist and supporting secession for groups uh, in Asia for, or in um, Africa for a variety of cynical reasons. Take, for example, South Sudan. Uh, and, uh, but when, of course, we all know what would happen if, say, the Hawaiians expressed any uh, desire to express their own self-determination or any group within the United States, right? The, the missiles would fly, the, the American army would be sent in and teach those people uh, a lesson real quick. So self-determination in general, not just the Americas, not just the British, but any state where self-determination seems like it might actually be a threat to your own state is not to be allowed. Self-determination is okay for other governments. I mean, somewhere else in the world, if, uh, if the French empire is gonna be split up, well, that's fine for Americans, uh, but uh, the, the needs of state never allow self-determination uh, within your own borders, within your own empire. Now, in response, of course, to uh, these, uh, these, this reluctance from the major imperial powers to grant any sort of self-determination, uh, which was seen as unilateral secession, that is, where you were seceding without the approval of the metropole, the central state, uh, they, there were many attempts then to, to control who qualified as colonial. And so it was the thinking went that, well, if you were non-colonial subjects, well, you weren't allowed to secede. So oh, immediately now, we can see how there was an attempt to say, yeah, well, the, okay, we all agree that's a colony far away and those people get to secede, but somewhere closer to home, you, you, you don't get to secede. And it got so ridiculous that there were, there were explanations of how, well, it is colonial if your colony is separated from the home country by a body of salt water. If it's only separated from the home country by, say, a river, a big lake, mountains, or deserts, that doesn't count. Uh, and even in some cases, the salt water didn't count in the case of how France always considered Algeria to be part of core France. And so that's part of why they fought so long against Algerian secession. But Algeria had seats in the parliament and everything. And the French were like, hey, Algeria, it's, it's France. It's not a colony of France, it is France. And so they weren't about to let those people have uh, their self-determination. And also there was an argument then that remedial self-determination is the only sort of self-determination is allowed. And what did they mean by remedial? They meant, well, it has to, you need to be remedying like serious violations to self-determination human rights, right? So things like genocide or slavery, uh, really, really bad stuff. If it's just run-of-the-mill oppression, we're just taxing you into oblivion or not letting you practice your religion or something, as long as we don't murder you in large numbers, then no secession allowed. 
and lots of these. Uh, so it had to be uh, a, a case of self-determination self, uh, being uh, denied in extremis, extreme cases, and they weren't. Uh, they were denying then your right to secede in cases of in moderato was uh, the other term being bandied about. Now, of course, there's never any agreement as to how many abuses must be uh, endured before you can express self-determination via secession. Never any sort of objective uh, standard here. There's uh, no uh, objective standard as to how much public support do you need for secession before it is allowed. But the whole point of it was leave it up to the home country, leave it up to the important powers to decide, will decide whether you have suffered enough in order to be allowed self-determination. So through all this, though, it is important to remember that uh, it is not in dispute that the right to self-determination by secession exists. Um, and what this then means, therefore, is that the current borders of the world's sovereign states are neither sacrosanct nor perpetual in at least some cases. So this is basically, this is generally accepted theory among people working in international law and in the scholarship of self-determination. The debate, however, is over whether or not um, you, in your particular case, get to have self-determination. And uh, as we explained, right, the status quo powers, they have reasons uh, for not wanting that. Now, since the 40s, however, the concept of self-determination has broadened somewhat. Um, it's now certainly nowhere near Mises' interpretation of self-determination. But since 1970, even, we can find documents in the UN saying that, yeah, it doesn't have to actually be colonial anymore. Um, any, any country that has lost the support of, quote, unquote, the whole people, vaguely defined, I mean, that's unclear, but that if you don't have widespread support anymore now within a certain region, this region can legitimately secede. Uh, and that, that, that 1970 declaration of the principles of international law, it leaves the door open to a variety of different types of self-determination uh, in moderate cases, but of course states will tend to fight tooth and nail uh, to prevent that. But if you're interested in the overall general international discussion around this issue of self-determination, I certainly would recommend looking up these documents. Now, we can note also that Alan Buchanan who uh, he's written an entire book on secession and, and has lots of good key articles uh, in scholarly journals about secession and when it's allowed. Uh, David Gordon's reviewed at least one of his books on our site. Uh, he has some good comments on here, and he, he develops what he calls the, the pure plebiscite theory of the right to secede. This would describe Mises' position, right? Essentially, where anywhere you get a majority to vote uh, in favor of secession, then it has to be allowed. Uh, he doesn't mention Mises, but uh, Buchanan thinks this is an extreme theory, to say the least, uh, which should not be surprising at all. But if we needed to categorize Mises, yeah, he's at the more extreme end of when secession is allowed, but that should surprise probably nobody. Uh, nevertheless, we can note that plebiscites are not always used, right? Buchanan's thinking that, yeah, that's a very good rule, and then you can get a decent majority. Yeah, let them secede. Uh, and we can point to many cases of this. Iceland in 1944, Malta in 1964, Slovenia in 1990. These are all cases where plebiscites were used and these countries seceded. Uh, we could also conceivably include Norway in 1905, which had its own plebiscite when they seceded from Sweden. But of course, there are many cases where plebiscites aren't even used and those succeeded. The American Revolution, of course, is one case. Or we could note the Baltic states at the end of the Soviet Union, right? They didn't have, uh, they seceded so quickly and in, uh, and in such an um, unusual fashion, I don't mean that in a bad way, uh, that uh, th they didn't really have time to put together some sort of lengthy plebiscite process. Uh, but, of course, they've done quite well for themselves since they did secede. Now, so, yeah, who gets self-determination? Uh, well, we, we might appropriate an old joke about socialism and say that self-determination is like food in a socialist state. Not everybody gets some. And why doesn't everybody get some? It's, it's because the existing polities, uh, they're, inc they're not inclined to reduce their own power. But they have come up with lots of arguments as uh, to, to why that needs uh, uh, to happen. 
But I would note that before we, we proceed, we'd have to make sure and note that self-determination is an individual right in this thinking. This is an objection that's often raised, not so much by the powers of that be, but it's, it's kind of one of these, when you encounter libertarians or even just sort of your run-of-the-mill center-right conservative types, um, they like to talk about how, well, I'm in favor of individual rights, so secession is a group right. It's a, and I'm, I'm against collectivism. I mean, really, all they're doing is promoting the status quo. I mean, you, if you look through the BS, I mean, that's all it is, is I like things the way they are, so I'm against any sort of secession. And that's really what they're saying. And they really want the central government to remain in power. Uh, so they, they've manufactured this idea that, well, I'm in favor of individual rights. I guess it's sort of a gotcha thing. It should be noted, however, that Buchanan, Rothbard, Locke, none of these people thought that self-determination wasn't a right of individuals. Mises explicitly states this. They all saw it as a right of individuals expressed by groups of people, right? The, the, uh, this is just simply a reality of living on planet Earth. I mean, Buchanan notes this. He, Locke's right of revolution falls into this category. It is, a, it is an individual right expressed by groups of people. However, uh, simply the reality is, is that because of the way states function and the fact that groups that have a monopoly and the means of coercion are unlikely to grant you the right of self-determination unless you're able to put forward some sort of real group resistance, the fact is you're not going to get self-determination in the real world unless you can assemble an actual group to really put it forward. And that's where we see that it would seemingly be maybe that self-determination is some sort of group right, but it's not. None of the people who are uh, among our liberal groups who are arguing in favor of, of uh, self-determination are arguing that this is some sort of group thing. They argue that, no, it, it stems from individual rights, but they also live in the real world and recognize that if you just stand up and, you know, you, you know, like these sovereign citizen types where they stand up and they're like, well, I don't have to do what the cops say, even though he's got a gun in my face, because I'm a sovereign citizen. Well, you know, we all know how that turns out. So expressing your individual rights often just simply doesn't work. Um, saying that you have the right is not sufficient in the real world. So the, the last part of this I think that we need to talk about is how the issue of uh, self-determination is the opposite of imperialism and colonialism. And we need to make the point that every time we look at one of these arguments against secession, at its core is always an imperialistic and colonialist argument. It's always couched in terms of these people cannot be allowed to have self-rule because they're uncivilized, they're barbarians, they'll be poor if, if we do it, they'll squander the freedoms that we've given them. And you see it both historically and now, right? Historically, you saw it all over the place. You saw it with Right, the usual pith helmet wearing uh, imperials, you know, droning on about the white man's burden, about how we're spreading civilization and we can't let these people have any self determination because they don't know how to do it. This argument is really not any different from the people we encounter now. People like Joy Reid, who says that if national divorce in the United States is allowed, then half the country will live in a apartheid hellscape where there will be no health care and all, all women will be enslaved was basically what she was saying. So I, it's clear what her conclusion is, right? If we let half the country govern themselves, well, they'll institute slavery, they'll destroy the economy, it will become hell on earth. Um, and we see something similar also from Zach Weissmuller at uh, the Cato Institute who says, well, if you let people, say, in Florida secede and break off, well, they'll, they'll, well, how does he put it? He says, Florida lawmakers will shrug off the First Amendment and ban offensive speech. Cops everywhere won't need to concern themselves about violating citizens' constitutional right. So in uh, this Catoite's mind, if you let any of these uh, conservative types have any sort of self-determination, they'll immediately set to work banning free speech and having the cops beat up everybody everywhere. Uh, the answer, of course, in their minds is, uh, well, we don't have to worry about rights being violated. We just let the U.S. Supreme Court determine what people's rights are. As long as Congress is in charge, people's rights won't be violated. And that's just generally the choice that you're given is, well, you can have secession 
Uh, or we can continue to have everyone ruled from the center of the metropole, that is from Washington, D.C., or from London, or from Paris, and ensure that you govern yourselves in line with human rights, with humanitarianism, with civilization. And so I fail to see much difference at all between the claims being made by the anti-secessionists at work in the United States now who don't want any sort of group, the Texans or whoever, even the Californians, right? Because you'll see libertarians say, well, we can't let the Californians govern themselves um, because they'll do left-wing stuff. The only way you can ever really be consistent if you're in favor of self-determination is to let people who you don't agree with have self-determination. Rothbard was consistent on this. Uh, Mises was consistent on this. Mises didn't care that there would be some people declaring self-determination who might practice religions or speak languages that he didn't particularly like. They were consistent. However, those who uh, put themselves on the side of, well, humanitarianism requires that we maintain control at the center, what they're saying is, well, self-determination doesn't apply when the people who want self-determination are insufficiently civilized. No difference between the left saying that about Texans, uh, no different, that is simply not different from some guy in London uh, talking about how we can't let the Nigerians ever have their own country um, because they might do things uh, in an incorrect fashion. One could argue that, sure, maybe they will do things in an incorrect fashion, but ultimately, how do they make sure you don't do things in an incorrect fashion? They stick a gun in your face, and they make you do things the way that people in London think things should be done. And I would just leave uh, you with Mises' comment on this, because Mises, of course, was fervently against um, colonialism. And he saw it as basically a long history of bloodbaths. He saw it as the position of tyranny. He understood also that to impose the European way of life on people because you felt they couldn't rule themselves was really just to turn them against you in the long run. That, and we see this, the fruits of this now, all of this left-wing, anti-Western stuff, those people colonized us. Just think how much less of a handicap we would have in spreading the good Western ideals if Westerners hadn't spent so many decades shooting people who disagreed with Western ideals. And so always just remember that you can have self-determination or you can have imperialism. I think these are really just the two choices that are available. And the way that we exercise self-determination is via secession. And we need to really look to the radical liberals like Rothbard and Mises for a good understanding of how that works and what the benefits are. Thank you very much.